Um, you know, the biggest concern for the foreign investor is the death tax. Quite often they talk to you about the income taxes. We're going to get to that too. Um, but the hub of the tax planning is the death tax. And this is because the foreign investor does not have our exemption of almost 5.5 million. The foreign investor has an exemption of only um, of only 600,000. And um, that um, um, applies to um, uh, his worldwide assets. So if he has $1 million in the United States and has $9 million outside the United States, yeah. only one tenth of that 60000 is his exemption. The other part, and we're going to get into this too, is the income taxation. Quite often the foreign investor will like to use a foreign corporation to own the property. And the problem with any corporate structure, as almost all of us know, is double taxation. So a foreign corporation is a C corp. Uh, it's just like a domestic C corp that's going to pay a tax price. The actual hard part about the foreign investor owning it in the name of a foreign corporation or themselves in the or through a foreign, other foreign entity like a foreign partnership, is the withholding tax on the FRIPTA. And most of you have probably dealt with that. When, even with the sale of a home, you have to do a FRIPTA um, report saying that you're not a foreign person. So this method is used to address all of these concerns. And um, what we're going to look at is the ownership by a trust. And when I sent out that um, newsletter, we actually had that diagram here. And we're going to, go, we're going to get down to that. And, uh, and looking at the diagram, for those of you who know tax law sections, there's two sections that really are important. One is section 2036, and this is the one that is most difficult for all tax planning. Mm -hmm. And it, it is when you place assets into an entity and you have certain rights, the right to even enjoy the property, the right to enjoy the income, the right to take off the income. So when you have a foreign, when you have any corporation, if you're the sole shareholder, you undoubtedly have the rights to draw out the funds. And as I'm talking here, if anybody has a question and want to inter, you know, inter, inter, interrupt me, either send me a chat or just speak up through your mic. Or if you're on the um, conference phone line, just you know, just ask me the your your question, and we can ad address the question. And we're going to get into Section 2036 in depth because those of you who do domestic tax planning come across this issue all the time with family and limited partnerships. The one that's quite often forgotten is Section 2038. And, um, you know, generally tax planners are aware of that. And that's why when we do a living revocable trust, we know those assets are in our taxable state. The IRS has used this um, in the past and been very successful. So back to the foreign partnership or even a foreign foundation of, you know, the um, 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 uh, foundation of one in Panama, when the founder or the owner of the corporation owns more than half the shares, he has the power to be both. So there's two tax laws that address a structure other than the trust, trust structure. So that's why the trust structure is so important. The other thing about a corporation, when in a domestic corporation, we know there's double taxation. We know if we do not pay out the profits, there is the tax called the accumulated earnings and profits tax. That's a tax when you should have paid out a dividend and you did not. But the foreign corporation also has the same time of tax. They call it a branch profit tax. And it's the same thing. If you have profits retained in your corporation um, and you don't pay it out to the um, shareholder, you get hit with this tax. So what we want is an entity that's only taxed once that um, gets long-term capital gains. The other part with a corporation, as all of you know, a corporation does not get long-term capital gains. That's not a concept to the corporate taxpayer. So the best method that I've come across is the LLC. We're going to kind of go over this, if I can get my screen to pop up. And so it starts off with a typical type of estate planning trust. So estate planning trust is one that's not revocable. And 
generally not subject to amendments. Um, or if it is subject to amendments, generally it's either to clean up a a, a spiritual error, you know, a typing error, or report approval. And the IRS has moved really towards a pro um, taxpayer approach this last decade, just about with the rulings on what's called a private trust company. And a private trust company is a corporation. Um, it's just a typical corporation. The two states that have the best laws for these private trust companies are Nevada and Delaware. And under the IRS rulings, the trust settler can also own the, the trust company. And there's certain requirements as to who could be on the board of directors and what their powers are. So I want to kind of talk about this. This is really a new item. The state of Nevada has taken it one step further, and the IRS has actually ruled on that new step as being allowed for state tax planning. So the private trust company, the way that works is that I, I say I want to do it for my, my own estate tax planning. I would own the corporation, and the corporation would be the trustee of the trust. Now, it really sounds like I have control over the trust. So what the IRS has been focusing at is Section 2036 for the private trust company and Section 2038. So as long as I do not have the power to approve a distribution, everything's going to be fine. So I can direct all the investments. I can do all the investment management. But when it comes to distributions, I need to have a separate board of directors that, that's going to authorize the distribution. And that board of directors cannot be an employee of, of, of mine, cannot be anybody who is under my control. But it can be, of course, a child. And a child is a great one, um, assuming you think they are responsible, because they are what's considered an adverse party to me since they're the trust beneficiary. But it also can be your longtime family attorney, your business friend, um, and you have the power to actually decide who stays on the board. And the IRS likes, allows the, the majority rule to apply to the board of directors. So that's a very useful approach. When Nevada, but you know, the downside to this is that it's expensive to set up. And the problem is you may not have the right family person to take over the private trust company when you pass away. So Nevada mm -hmm. solved this problem by enacting a statute to protect the corporate trustee, like Northern Trust, from any fiduciary responsibility when the trust is what's called self-directed. So much like your, your IRA or your self-directed 401k. And here, once again, back to my example. So I set up my trust. Instead of, of me having my corporate trustee right here that I own, I go to Northern Trust, and I say, I would like to do a self-directing trust. And Northern actually has a sample trust online on, on their Las Vegas office website that shows exactly what they would like. Um, you, of course, can change that to your family needs, but it shows the powers that you can have. And the powers are fantastic. I can have the power to direct all the investments. Because what you don't want with a trustee, you don't want them to take over your investment. You may want it to be in a family business, as we, as, as the clients have. So the client can keep that power. Um, your auto connection has been lost, it says here. You're experiencing degrade quality. Okay. So it says my auto connection is lost. Um, so I'm hoping all of you will go through the chat here in... Um, um, dial in to this chat to my um, my number here. So let me just do this again because um, I want to be sure all of you can hear what's going on here. Um, please check your, next, your network. Connection has been lost. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. So let me give you all this phone number again. Those who are on the conference line, just hold on for a second.
get this right here. There we go. Okay, seven one six. Okay. So the self directed trust allows me to have all the power to direct to direct um, the investments. The trustee has no responsibility for distributions. The IRS says in the ruling. Once again, um, um, once again, the distribution has to be a separate group of people. I cannot have the power to make the distribution, but I can have a distribution committee, um, which I explain in the trust, or I can use an LLC to be the um, person with the power to do the distributions. And this works well because if I don't have somebody in my family, a adult child, to take over the private trust company, then the advantage is the corporate trustee will step in upon my death. So this is this is actually my preferred method, a lot cheaper to set up. There's one bank in Nevada called Premier Bank. They are only charging $2,500 to be trustee. So it's really a good deal. Um, what, what's the name of the bank again? Called Premier Bank, P-R-I-E-M-E-R -E -E Bank. Um, and they, and that's really by far the best deal. Um, um, so I want to go into the next part of the, the tax law, which is the problem with a foreign corporation. Because if you get on the web, you're going to see that the web people are talking about using a foreign corporation. And it's because they have missed two big things. One is a 1950 court case, which we're going to get to after we, we go over this. But the more current um, tax planners know the, of the of the Strangey case. This was the first IBIS victory on blowing apart the family limited partnership. Now that was used to get discounts and so forth. And what the IRS did, and it, it amazes me it took them that long, in these type of structures, <clears throat> the intent was that the parent would get most of the money from the partnership because that's what the parent needed. And it may be a, an implied agreement. It may be seen by the way you design the partnership. In all these cases that I list here, the IRS won. Matter of fact, the IRS won every case, just about, as far as I can recall. And they did it because <clears throat> the parent had the right to either enjoy the income or receive the income. And um, so that's the real test. And the test is at the time you set up the entity. So um, it was real easy for the IRS to do. They would get the correspondences from the accountant because that's not privilege, emails and so forth, uh, take 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 um, uh, uh, depositions and really just saw, hey, we, we were trying to get the gift, the the uh, the uh, gift tax discount or the state tax discount on on these these partnership shares. But of course, my parents expected to have the cash flow from the partnership. So <clears throat> the same applies if I own all the stock of a foreign corporation. Undoubtedly, I have the right to draw out all the um, um, dividend income. And I have an example here on this website about uh, uh, Mr. O'Keefe, an Irish man like myself. And um, so he, he wants to buy a home in the United States. And one person is just like us. If they're going to buy a home where they're going to live, they need to do a Cooper trust. And most of you who've done tax planning, you've heard the term where you've dealt with it before. The exact thing, same thing takes place. But the difference is they have to fund the trust with money before they buy the property. Because once they own the real estate, if they gift it, there's a gift tax due. And their exemption is not going to be the 5.5 again. It's going to be um, either nothing or maybe, maybe $100,000. So um, it's important that if you're going to help the foreign investor, that he gets involved with you before he buys the property. Once he buys the property, it's really going to be difficult. He's going to have to um, 
form a new trust by the the home from the new trust into the new trust is going to have withholding tax on a filter. You can do it. It's just that it's a lot of work. Um, the, withhold, the withholding tax, of course, is going to be at 10%. Um, <clears throat> you can get the holding tax waived if you're doing it to a corporate trust because that's going to be a grantor trust for income taxes. So that's one way to kind of reduce the tax impact. But once again, Brian, excuse me, what, what type of trust do you see Mexican nationals using? Mexican, Let's say over 500,000. Mexican nationals, if they're doing the planning, they would do the same thing. Thing they would use a a a qualified personal um, resident trust. They're the same position as any other alien, um, a little bit worse off because their nation does not have a state and gift tax treaty, and that does help you. Um, so that's an 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 advantage. Um, would you only use this for homes over a certain price? A home if over, over about fifty thousand dollars. Okay. Yeah, because their exemption is part of the sixty thousand, and once again, it's divided, is prorated between their worldwide assets. So if they have a lot of wealth in Mexico and a small wealth here, that sixty thousand will be reduced to that fraction. So um, they, the, you know, they, they like everybody else have to be proactive. If they're not been proactive, then they're going to have to go through the IRS ruling process and get an exemption from FRIPTA and put it into a, a cupid. the problem is the gift tax again, because they do not have our big gift tax exemption. So, so this is the problem. They actually have to fund the, 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 the cupid trust with cash in a way that's not subject to, to gift tax, and then have the cupid trust do a transaction with them and have the IRS rule that the actions dis that, that the transactions disregarded because the Cupid Trust is a grantor trust. So as you can would see, a tech, yeah. would a LLC also work? No, no, it has to be a trust for estate planning because be yeah, it has to be a trust, okay. right? What, Brian, what did you call the trust? Qualified Fi qualified personal residence trust. So if you get on the web and talk, and you see that you see the IRS actually has a has a has a template, a sample trust that you can use. Um, they've been around for, uh, I don't know, 20 or 30 years. They're done a lot by U.S. citizens for um, estate tax planning. So they're, you know, they're pretty well, well they're, they're really straightforward. People understand them, uh, and they're a great tool for the foreign investor. So I want to get to this old case that, um, we'll skip the book ad for a second. I'm going to get to this old case that um, that people have a hard time finding. And um, once again, you can you know get this off my blog, but you'll get a, a recording of this too. Um, and and in this in this case, this is a uh, case really old from the from the 1939 tax code, but the laws were the same there as they are now. And this case is is a typical case of somebody thinking they've done some uh, sophisticated tax planning. So this case involved a person who did a um, a, a stuffing. And a stuffing is a foundation. And when you get into foreign entities like um, foundations, the tax law um, looks at them either as a trust or as a corporation. And this one was seen to be a corporation. And the foreign person had the power to amend and revoke the foundation. And while the case has a lot of great explanation of these foreign entities, it was really just this power here that killed the tax planning. And the court went on to hold that this entity is a corporation for U.S. tax laws, a foreign corporation. So it's identical to somebody who forms the BVI corporation. They're just like this person here. And that's why the corporation is um, not the way to go. Like I said, you'll have this as a recording. Um, I'll send you all this, 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 this PDF file so that you have it for your uh, reference because you're going to get a lot of pushback from the foreign person. He's going to done his research on the web. 
he's going to say, gee, I saw 50 websites that said I could use a foreign corporation. And they like that. That's cheap. They have all this control. And the problem is they have all this control. That's why it's in the tax Brian, Brian, excuse me. I've seen some foreign corporations where they use it for purchase of large tracts of undeveloped land. That's too bad. That would be in the taxable estate. Yes, okay. So you really have to, just like an American, if I want assets out of my taxable estate, I either have to give the assets outright to my children or I have to use a trust. Those are the only two choices I have. The foreign investor doesn't get any special choices. They don't get any um, special break. Matter of fact, if anything, the law is more biased against them because the exemption is only $60,000 instead of 5.5. Um, so I kind of want to get into, you know, I just want you to see that this is in this file. Uh, it's a long case. I have the whole case here for you. Um, and I want to get into the more um, important aspects, which is the actual, um, if I get through this case, the actual planning itself. Family council. So, you know, this is a little bit like the private trust company. Only you want your family council to, when it decides distribution not to be the client, not to be the 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 owner of the of the corporation. Um, much like uh, much like a, a, a private trust company in Nevada, these foreign it, 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 these foreign um, um, entities have rules of bookkeeping and balance sheet. So quite often the client thinks um, that that they can just be really kind of kind of treat it like their own asset, <clears throat> and that's really the problem. Once they treat it like their own asset, then then they're in big trouble. Um, okay, we'll go back up to our diagram and, and just go through this in more in depth. So the the the, pro, the method I like. Bob, as you point out, is the LLC under the trust. And you'll see here, I would have an LLC for each type of entity. One would be the um, uh, um, investment property, let's say. If it's a second home, if it's a vacation home versus a primary home for the trust settler, then you have a lot of leeway. Um, so some families just have a vacation home. The uh, Children of the trust settler are older. They have their own grandchildren. They may be actually even in the United States. So it's a beach home, let's say. Um, when it's a beach home, um, you can design your trust in your LLC operating agreement so that the trust settler is going to have to pay rent if he's going, but his children do not. When the trust when the trust settler is with his children, then they don't have to, to pay rent. Um, but if the settler's there by himself and it's not a cooper, in this trust I don't have it as a cooper, then you want them to pay rent. If there's only going to be a family home owned by the uh, trust settler and he's going to be in it, then you would actually want one more trust over here as a as a as a cooper. This corporation could, of course, be the trustee or it could be self-directed, but you would want a trust just outside of this circle here. Then quite often the foreign investor does not understand that only shares in the U.S. stock market or a small U.S. business is also in this taxable state. So there's a lot of foreign investors with portfolios, um, with maybe Merrill Lynch, of U.S. stocks, um, maybe stock funds. All that is back in the taxable state. Once again, that only has that $60,000 exemption. The IRS has just been blasted by Congress for not having special reporting required for this type of a person. So we should expect in this next um, 24 months, because the IRS doesn't move that fast, a new type of reporting regulation by the broker when the investor is a foreign person. Now right now the broker knows he's a foreign person because of the W-8 bin. You know, we have this new thing with the with the Foreign Tax Compliant Act, the FACTA. So all the the um, stockbrokers had to upgrade their um, compliance with a foreign investor with a new type of W-8 bin. Uh, so they already have the information for income taxes. Well, the IRS now is going to want them to do a reporting for estate and gift tax. So if there's any transfer of these funds um, out of the account, then that's going to cause for a special gift tax 
um, reporting. And as you know, Brian, uh, yes, Bob. We've always we've always seen the proven structure to be the offshore, say a, a, a Dutch company which owns the Texas LLC, which owns the real estate. Right, and that's 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 really the point. This is that's that, still an okay, isn't it? Oh no, that's that's never been okay. So back to this 1939 court case, that structure because the client has the power to revoke it, or he and his family have the power to revoke it. Those assets are going to be in this taxable state. So that's a bad structure. You want to change that over to this structure. And that, you know, Bob, you bring up a good point. That's what you're going to see on the web. You're going to see this method. And, you know, part of going to a tax seminar is, is kind of like um, people following what they heard in their tax seminars. So when a case takes place in 1939, it was probably the talk of the town in you know, or, or 1940, in 1950, um, um, but you know there wasn't that much estate planning seminars back in the old days, and especially during World War II. So these cases don't really get placed onto the um, speaker's agenda. So the, really the point of my blog and in, in, in this talk is to let you know what the tax law is, and not what's on the web. And so, Bob, right, if you went to the web, people would talk about a BVI company, you know, one in the British Virgin Islands, a Dutch, a Dutch corporation. But all those people just follow the other people who talked about it. They never done their own research. And they're not looking at not only this 19, this case from 1939, but the cases from, from the beginning of this century on family partnerships. So that's why it's really important. And if you do have clients who have that arrangement, to slowly work into this trust arrangement here. Um, and uh, if it's real estate, you want to be sure they get a IRS ruling to exempt them from the Foreign Investors Real Property Tax Act. That's doing that's filter, that's the withholding. If it's not real estate, if it's just stocks in a corporation, that's very nice because a foreign person can make a gift to shares of a corporation, domestic or foreign, with no US gift tax. So there's one set of tax laws. <laughs> there's, there's some unique tax laws for state and gift taxes for the foreign investors. The state tax laws are really bad, but the gift tax laws are fabulous. And so as long as the foreign person is gifting intangible property, that would be stocks, bonds, copyrights, patents, even if they have a U.S. situs, there's no gift tax. If they're giving uh, if they're giving assets that's tangible like real property, then you look at to see where it's located, and then if it's in the United States, there's gift tax. So, but Bob, that was a great question, and that's really um, something you want to look at. So, back when your structure, if they do have this this foreign corporation owning something, <clears throat> they would want to gift that foreign corporation into the trust because that's gift tax free, and then they want to do the tax planning with that foreign corporation. They probably can't dissolve it because that would be a taxable event, but they can at least get it out of the taxable state by taking those shares of the foreign corporation during a tax-free gift into this trust up here. So that's that's a, a great question, and um, uh, that's really kind of the, the, the point of this structure. So back to this, if you own shares of the stock market, you can use the same entity for this. Um, investment property is great in this structure. You can get long-term capital gains when you sell the property, which is really nice. You're not going to get that but, no, bought back into your structure. When they sell that property in that foreign corporation through the LLC, it's not going to be long-term capital gain. So they're going to get the highest tax rate instead of the lowest tax rate. Um, and How about they own it for five years? And then... Oh, they own for five years of the corporation? The a, LLC, well, they sell it. Well, the, a, the problem is that the paying person, the paying taxpayer is the corporation. That, you know, that LLC is a pass-through entity. So when the LLC sells the property, that gain is going to be reported on the foreign corporation's return. And a corporation is not allowed, does the... the um, Income tax laws for a corporation do not include a, a concept of a lower tax rate on capital gains, or even long-term capital gains. So it's going to be taxed at the highest corporate tax rate, 
but there's a little bit more. So let's say, let's go back to this structure. Let's say it, it owned uh, two pieces of real estate and it sells one. Then what's going to happen, not only are they going to pay income tax at the highest corporate tax rate, they also are going to pay tax again under this branch profit tax. Because what the branch profit tax says is, it says just it's the same tax as we have for a domestic corp. If any corporation a, a, a accumulates profits that they don't need for a business and, do, and does not pay it out to the shareholder, then this a deemed tax there's a tax on what they consider to be a deem dividend. So right now the tax rate's 20%, so that's not too bad. But you would have a you would have a you would have a US tax rate of 35% on the gain of the property, maybe a state tax. And then on top of that, you would have the branch profits tax rate of 20% again. Now it's not quite 55% because you get to deduct the US income tax. But it's going to be 48 percent. It's going to be a big portion of the gain, and that's why you don't want. No, that's the other reason besides the state and gift tax, why you don't want to be in the um, uh, uh, corporate structure. Now, Bob, if your if your client were to place that corporation into this trust, he's still going to be taxed with that taxation with the corporation because you can't undo that corporation if the if the asset has gone up in value, that's a taxable event. If they just bought the property, well, then it's fine. You can get an exemption from the IRS on the withholding tax under the Foreign Investors Real Property Tax Act. But if had it for a long time, they're going to have to keep it in the corporation and then face that higher tax rate. So I've left some time for questions. Um, you can either send the question to me as a chat or you can uh talk over your microphone or on the the uh if you're on the um 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 can we have some questions now yeah absolutely brian? bob yeah absolutely okay brian in texas the proven entity the most popular entity for ownership of, of real estate oil and gas is the texas llc 67 percent of all entities are the llc and that's what a lot of these Mexican nationals are using now to, to purchase retail centers, office buildings. If they want, if the client's insistent on using a Texas LLC because it's simple, inexpensive, and easy to set up, which entity would you then suggest that should be the members of the LLC? Ah, uh, that's a great question. Let, let me that get... a foreign corporation won't work. No, no. So, you know... Just like a, Americans, um, none of us like to spend money on um, fees to an attorney. <laughs> none of us like to spend money on estate planning. So, right. So, simple is is like an equation. Simple equals higher taxes. So, as long as they are willing to pay the death tax, then it's fine to keep it simple. Um, um, and so that's what the client has to decide. If if you know if, if it's a short-term investment, maybe he won't die and it'll be just fine. If it's like a home that's to be kept in the family, or people from you know Latin America kind of want a safe haven in the United States, and my Asian clients, quite a few of them are buying homes here. In, in particular, just to be frank, they don't trust their government. I mean, you know, I guess. None of us trust our government, so they see America as better than their home, the home country. But they plan to have this home forever. Um, then you truly want to, you know, as an attorney as you are, Bob, you want to issue correspondence to um, protect yourself from malpractice, saying to them, you know, uh, if you, it's fine that you own it outright, it's simple, it's cheap, but you're going to pay death tax, and don't come blaming me. Um, and I think that's the uh, uh, Brian. We're seeing mo the difference in San Antonio now is that most of the Mexicans are purchasing residence here and living here. Yes, we see that here. In fact, the Mexico is different. Yeah, and, and we see that here in 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 California too. They're in North San Diego County. They're buying fantastic homes. They're bringing over jobs and deployment. It's a great it's a great boom to our state. Um, and it's the same thing. So when it's a family home, the least expensive trust, what's good about that is a, 
a um, qualified personal resident trust is not expensive to set up. Uh, you know, the pre, uh, not, not quite generic, but almost um, every small business estate planning law firm knows how to do it. It's really standard. It's almost like a commodity. Uh, it's not as elaborate as this. So they could do a, a um, Cupid trust for maybe, I don't know, five, ten thousand dollars $10,000, depending upon what the fees are in your state for, for, you know, for a law firm. And really have assurances, because IRS has so many guidelines on it now, that they've done great estate planning without going for a, a IRS um, ruling. So I think for the foreign person who wants to buy a home here, the key is they have to form the trust before they buy the home. They have to fund the trust because once they buy the home, like I said, a gift of uh, real estate is a taxable gift, a gift of money. Does that protect them against FERPTA too? Uh, no, FERPTA is income tax. So we have estate and gift tax. We have we have we have we have in income tax. Well, I, I'm sorry, Bob. Yes, it would. Because, you know, it depends. If it's sold after they die, it would because that qualified personal resident trust becomes a separate tax person and as a domestic person during the life of the of the client that the, the trust settler is a it's a grantor trust so if they sold the home they would get long-term capital gain um but you know if they're living here bob they'll probably become a u.s tax resident and they probably don't have FERPTA. that's a good question but FERPTA, i think an llc would protect you against FERPTA. No, because it's a pass-through. So they're going to, so the escrow, at least here in California, we have what's called an escrow firm that handles sales. I know each state's different, sometimes the law firm. So the, the, the rules for Section 1445, which is the withholding tax law for FIPTA, has you look at the entity that owns it. If it's a pass-through, they're going to want to see who the actual taxpayer is. If they're insistent on using the LLC, what underlying, uh, who would you suggest don't be the members of the LLC? Well, the only safe place is a trust. That's the only safe, okay. that, that's, the, that's the only, I mean, like I said, <clears throat> in America, the only way to avoid estate and gift tax is either to give it outright to your children, I mean, they could do that, or to a trust. The advantage of the trust is that a Nevada trust could grow for 365 years. If, you know, if it was only a 10-year investment, um, you know, the client probably won't die, like it's an oil and gas property. It really looks at, you know, it really depends on the age of the client and how long they plan to hold to um, um, hold the investment. Uh, so uh, an LLC owned by a qualified personal residence trust? Yes, that's very sure. popular. Yes, okay. that's very popular. We do that a lot in California. We have a lot of clients who actually have that structure. Um, uh, for a variety of, of asset protection um, reasons because the family trust may have other assets in it. So the advantage of the LLC is to do asset pro pro protection to this family trust. Asset protection, exactly. It has better asset protection than a corporation. Absolutely. And they're cheaper and easier to manage. So here are the tax accounting is really easy. This, this income goes right up to this family trust any gains or income from the U.S. Um, uh, stock port, port, portfolio goes up to this trust. Uh, if there's a family home, if it's not used primarily by the settler when it's sold, it's going to get long-term um, gains up here. This will be a domestic trust. So you don't have for this any problems, Bob, with, 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 with the Foreign Investors Real Property Tax Act. So that's the advantage here, too. You actually get it. You know, you avoid if that. They, with Brian, tax. once they become a U.S. taxpayer, they don't have the, uh, the LLC will work fine. The LLC works fine. So that's a really an important question. I want to get to that because that's one thing that's not talked about much. So when somebody becomes a U.S. tax resident with a green card, the question becomes, what is the exemption? Is it sixty thousand dollars? Let me go to the top here. Is it sixty thousand dollars? Or is it $5.5 million? So what the tax law says is when a foreign person is a domicile in this country, they get the 5.5. Domicile is not quite the same as an income tax resident. So domicile means that the United States is the primary home. 
So that means that if they have a home here, and Bob, in your case, a home in Mexico, it means that this has become their primary home. And how is that determined? By looking at the client's behavior. So, for example, um, he would get a driver's license in, in, in California. He, of course, would have, or in Texas, he, of course, would have a green card. Uh, he would uh, use this address for most of his reporting. He would maybe be active in his local church or golf club or something. But the foreign investor. Also, look, Brian, here, did they file for, an in, uh, for a homestead exemption for the real estate taxes? Fantastic. Right. 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 And we have that in California, Taxes too. Taxes are the high here. Most of you are seeing that. They, they go on and apply for a homestead exemption. Texas is a great state, Bob. Well, we're, you know, we're doing well, but our real estate taxes are the highest in the U.S. No way. Yes, well, they're high. I think they're the highest. They're they're increasing. You have to protest your taxes vigorously. Okay, that's a good job for attorneys. <clears throat> yes. So yes, so yes, yes. but he, you raised some good points, Brian, particularly on what because I see that question all the time. What is the proven structure? Right. For foreign investment into the U.S. And you're at a different level, but a lot of the accountants will reply just. Set up a foreign corporation, have it own the Texas entity, and then own the real estate. Right, right. And that's really the point of, of this talk in my blog is to try to bring that awareness that for a licensed tax advisor, that's just malpractice for us. That's that's the problem. It, it is. Yeah. Okay. How about some more questions? Jim, you have one? Uh, no, you've answered um, okay. most of them. Uh, is this... Is, is this a schemata that you've got in that that uh done here? That just for yeah, just for foreign investors or is well, no, it's really no. I think it's that's great. I think it's good for everybody. This this talk is about it. But for my clients, this is the profile that we have for my clients. Um, I'm starting to get away from the private trust company because it's just so expensive to set up and maintain, and your kids have to get involved so much in that. And I'm going more to the south. Directed trust. I do all, almost all my trust now in Las Vegas because they have such good trust laws. If properties owned in some other state, we form an LOC in that state to own the property. Um, but this structure with a with a self directed trust is so inexpensive to maintain. That's what I uh, like about it, Jim. Um, where the private trust company, you know, is fifty thousand dollars to set up, and then generally you should, should get an IRS ruling. And what I don't, what I have not liked about it is the, uh, it's a lot of things. One, most clients don't want to do all the maintenance. You need to meet in, in Nevada at least once a year with your board of directors, um, take good minutes. Um, you need an office for for this trust company for for the for the mail to come to it. Um, it was a great structure back in 2006 when it was first as I invented. Um, but really now, starting this last year, this self-directed trust is so much more streamlined, cheaper, and better, like I said, because when the client dies, you have a real trust company. Brian, which country? Yes, Bob. Uh, Brian, I wanted to ask you, too, excuse me, what country are you using or recommending for offshore company formations for Mexican nationals to avoid their Mexican blacklist? Ah, <laughs> Well, you know, the most popular one that I see is the American LOC, because uh, you know, when it's not when it's not owned by a U.S. person, it becomes a tax haven corporation. Mexico has filed a complaint with the Obama administration over the U.S. as a tax haven. Um, Obama, of course, did a good job. He didn't even reply. Was what that's what Obama does well, and um, but I, the the one that I see the most effective is the um, American LLC, either Nevada or Delaware. And then it's, you know, it could be owned by the client. It could be owned by um, a trust. The best, the best place for a foreign trust is New Zealand. That's, that's the place I would do my foreign trust. New Zealand, what about the Netherlands? Netherlands doesn't have a trust law. It has to be a common law jurisdiction to do a trust. Okay, okay, okay. New Zealand. All New right. Zealand, yeah, right, right. So it's a tax even for foreign trusts, and they have the concept of, of a self-directed uh, 
di directed trust in New Zealand too. So um, it's, it's, it's a good place. Okay, how about some more questions? Someone, you've been pretty quiet. Joyce, you've been pretty quiet. Oh, um, Christopher? It's like, okay, for the trust, um, so you have to find that the trust okay. return every year then? Well, then I think you all, you a couple. yes. Brian, I may send you a couple questions by chat. Sounds great, yeah, yeah. Just do that or just, you know, give me a call. It's always fun to talk to you. Um, and, um, I said I'm going to be re I'm recording this. I'm going to turn off the recorder now and save it out. I'll turn off it just, just a second, and I'll post it up on YouTube. So if you ever want to play this back to, to get some a refresher, I'll also send you this um, PDF file so you, so that you have that too. Brian, one last question: How would you advise a client, an offshore, a a, a foreign investor that that set up an all that a BVI? It owns the Texas Corporation, which owns a ranch. Ah. And they I, had it in place for 25 years. I mean, just leave it alone? No, no, no. I would get that BVI Corporation into this trust. No, it, it's a tax-free gift because it's, it's an intangible asset. So the foreign person could set up a trust, you know, an estate planning trust, um, and gift the asset into the estate planning trust. But you put the shares into the trust. Right, right. Right. Yeah, and I would either do a Nevada trust or a New Zealand trust for him. You know, the a Nevada trust. I mean, they're both good. They both do estate planning, so they're both um, um, the the both are are nice. So um, yeah. And, and of course, if they decide to sell it, I mean, you know, they're going to pay a lot of tax capital gains. Well, no, they're not going to get capital gains. That BVI corporation is going to prevent the capital gains. Okay, there won't be any capital gains. Won't be any capital gains, and if they don't dissolve the BVI corporation, they're going to end up paying tax twice. Um, so actually, with that in mind, they probably want a, assuming they're not a U.S. tax resident, they probably want the New Zealand trust. New Zealand trust. Okay. Right. Okay. So Brian, do you have the file that Sounds trust good, return Brian. every year then? And it was good, and I'll send you a couple questions by email. Sounds great. Thank you all. Okay. Have a great day. Thank you, Brian. Bye bye.